Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. All right, now, in my 32 years of coming to the Holy Land, Israel specifically, uh, this is an area that we've never been to. We have driven south. We're uh, not too far, actually, from Gaza, believe it or not. Now, I want to ask, the, this is totally unrehearsed. Is this not the most beautiful city we've been in? Yes. No, no joke. I, I didn't tell them to do that. I came through here. It looks like West Palm Beach, Florida. And what's the name of the city? Ashkelon. Ashkelon. Beautiful, right on the coast. You know, I think we ought to just go swimming. What do y'all think? Y'all yeah. got your stuff. When, this makes you want to get in the water, don't it? We are on the Mediterranean coast. I got to teach, man. I'm running out of time. But I have, a, I have a very important message for you today. It's something that I really feel like the Lord put on my heart. Now, the title is going to sound very odd, very unusual, but I call this the danger of the blessing deception. The danger of the blessing deception. What I want you to do is follow me very carefully. The main scripture I'm going to use as a foundation for this study is Genesis chapter 32, 24 through 26. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, this is Jacob talking now, I will not go unless you bless me. First of all, I want you to consider the word blessing. Uh, blessing, blessings, both singular and plural, are used in the Old Testament, which is predominantly written in the Hebrew language, and also the 27 books of the New Testament, which is predominantly, of course, in the Greek language. The two words basically mean the same thing, but let's look at this. In Hebrew, the word blessing means to supply an abundance and increase, either physical, spiritual, or in the material realm. In Greek, it means to enlarge, to bring benefits, largeness in every area of your life. If I were to sum up what blessing means from a biblical perspective, it simply means total increase, physical increase, which means health, spiritual increase, which means knowledge, wisdom, understanding, peace, and joy, and also mental increase with the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So we are a blessed people. Look at somebody right now. Say neighbor. neighbor. You got to say, oh neighbor. oh, neighbor. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And if you are in covenant with the Lord, you are absolutely blessed. However, I want to talk for a moment about a man that all he ever wanted was blessing. And that man was named Jacob. Think about this for just a moment. In his mother's womb, he is wrestling with his twin brother. And the Bible even tells you that when Esau is coming out of the womb, it's Jacob who catches the heel of his brother as if to say, no, I'm first. You get behind me. You know what I mean? There's a wrestling going on in his mother's womb. Jacob in Hebrew is the Hebrew word, Hebrew word, Yaakov. But if you take the root uh, word, Yaakov, it's the Hebrew word, Akeb, and it means to reach out. It actually means to catch the heel or to reach out. So in other words, Jacob is always reaching out for something. Now, that's not necessarily bad, but notice how what he did to try to get what he wanted. His whole character until God changed him was one of deception. For, as a matter of fact, think about this for just a moment. A moment. He tricked his brother to get his brother's birthright. Then he tricked his father to get his brother's blessing. Actually, it was his father's blessing. You see, the firstborn in the Bible, which would have been Esau, is supposed to have a double portion of the inheritance, and it's called the birthright and the blessing. The birthright comes through the double portion of the inheritance. For example, in the Bible, if you had all this property that we're looking at here, then the oldest son would get double of it, and then, you know, he'd get two-thirds, and the other kid would get the third. Well, Jacob didn't like that, so his brother comes in hungry one day, and he says, I'll fix you a bowl of boons. Uh, bowl of boons. That's a good... <laughs> what in the world is a bowl of boons? Blooper. Eh, we'll keep it in. A bowl of beans and a bowl of soup, we'd say today. And uh, his brother was willing to give up his birthright. Now, the blessing had to come from the patriarch. Abraham 
blessed Isaac. Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob, if you read Genesis 49, before he dies, calls his sons, lays hands on them, speaks a prophetic word over them, blesses them. Moses blessed the 12 tribes of Israel before he died. So the blessing had to be spoken by the patriarch. And when, you, when the blessing was spoken by the patriarch, it put favor. It's as though that, you know, this was amazing, but in the early days of what we call the Old Testament time, you'll discover that when they named a child, the name they would give the child ended up being prophetic. And I don't have time to preach on prophetic names in the Bible, but it's really interesting. It's as though that the patriarch or the parents knew the destiny of that child would be summed up in the name of that child. Uh, for example, when uh, Naomi had two boys, Mechalon and Kilion, and one of their names me means sick and the other means pining away. And guess what? They both died. They married and both died in Moab. So it's very important to understand the name. So Jacob has this name of one who's catching the heel, a supplanter, a heel catcher, going after, grabbing, reaching out for something all the time. And then when his uh, uh, brother Esau is out uh, hunting to bring his father Jacob some food, Jacob's a hoot man because Jacob said, I'm about to die. I want a last meal. And the guy lived another 20 years. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but he thinks he's dying. So you know the story of how Jacob comes in uh, to his fa uh, uh, father and he comes into Isaac, I should say. I got that backwards. But he comes into Isaac and Isaac can't see and he blesses Jacob instead of blessing Esau with the blessing. Bottom line is simply this. Here is a man by the name of Jacob who's always seeking after blessing. He always wants something, but he will do whatever it takes to get it. He goes all the way down to Laban and he gets married to a woman, gets the wrong one that has to work seven years to get the one he wants. But then he starts messing with nature. And the Bible begins to tell you there in the book of Genesis that in order for the pregnant cows to produce a certain type of cow, he put these reeds in the water when the cows were drinking. Now, don't ask me to figure that one out. I have never figured that one out. How putting a certain kind of a stick in water and a cow looking at it can make a cow produce a certain kind of cow, all right? Maybe we need to get all these women that want to get pregnant. If we put that in, you get a blonde-haired baby. You put that stick in there, you get a black-haired Okay, I'm getting crazy. I understand, all right? You got to understand we're having a great time here. But the point is, look at his life for years and years. What's he doing? He's always tricking somebody. He's trying to trick somebody. He's trying to deceive somebody. And so here's an angel. Check this out. An angel, he's wrestling an angel of God. And what does he say to this angel? Hey, man, I'm not going to let go till you what? Bless me. The guy is still seeking blessing all the time. Here's my point for you. He didn't need a blessing. He needed a transformation. He didn't need a blessing. He needed to change. So God changed his name from Yaakov or Jacob to Israel or Israel, which is one who is a prince with God. And he also, this is important, he, he hit him in the, in the thigh. So the rest of his life, Jacob limped. Everywhere he went, he had a limp. Now that's important because you know what? All of his life, he was on the run. Oh, you'll get this in a minute. All of his life, he's on the run. Bam, bam, go, go, go. Give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. So God slowed him down where he could no longer run from God. And God slowed him down where he had to depend on him in his walk. Oh, I could preach right there how God sometimes will allow things to happen to you that causes you to be dependent on him instead of depending on yourself. Now, the reason I'm pointing out this idea of the blessing, I will not let go to you bless me. In Hebrew, one of the words for bless, to be blessed is the word barak, and it, it carries the connotation of adoring something. We are to worship God. We are to bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord, barak the Lord, meaning to adore him to love him. So when we talk about how we want blessing, we talk, we talk about how we understand God's love and adoration for us. So why do we get blessed? Ready? Because he loves us. He adores us. Why do we bless him? Because we love him. We adore him. So blessing is a two-way path of God blessing you because he adores you and you blessing God because, and it's just wonderful to be, don't y'all get a touchy feely feeling right now? Just how much God, really seriously, how much God cares about you. But here's some Something that I believe the Holy Spirit really put in my heart, and that is this, that to, a lot of today's preaching is centered on, uh, you know, being happy and how to have, you know, having a great life, which is fine. But the problem with it is, is there are men and women who go to church consistently and have never had a radical transformation. And so they come service after service and they seek the blessing or they're experiencing a blessing atmosphere. But when they leave that atmosphere, nothing in their life has changed. They are like Jacob. They're seeking the blessing part, the birthright, the blessing, but yet they really need a transformation on the inside. Now, here's where I'm going with this. I'm going to call this the blessing deception. Here's why I call this the blessing deception. There are people that believe if they can 
just as long as they can feel God's presence, everything must be okay with their life. There are people that feel like that if they're prospering financially, no matter how they're living, everything must be all right and God must have favor on them because after all, they couldn't prosper if the favor wasn't there and the, and the prosperity wasn't there. There are other people uh, that uh, do just do certain things and you're looking at them and you're saying, now they're doing that, they shouldn't be doing that, they're saying that, they shouldn't be saying that. They're living in unforgiveness and they know better than that and yet because they can go to church and feel the presence of God and sing in the choir or still minister or whatever, they think that God's approval must be on them because there is some kind of a blessing that still remains on them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. I call this the deception of the blessing. Now, to understand the, 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 the deception of the blessing, you got to understand a man named Samson. I'm going to step right back here, Robbie. These are columns made of granite. Now, in the time of Samson, you know this, that all the temples were, had rock columns like this, whether, uh, you know, the temple of Dagon, for example, because we know that Samson took these pillars and got between two of them, and there happened to be pillars here, and they were, of course, much closer, and he pushed, and he brought the entire Dagon temple down on his enemies, killed more enemies in his death than he did throughout his life. So, but I want to talk to you for just a moment about Samson. What made Samson different is this. He was born a Nazarite. And a Nazarite vow is recorded in Numbers chapter 6, verses 2 through 21. Now, let me give you for a moment what a Nazarite vow actually is. If you were born a Nazarite, you were different from all the other men that were born in Israel. All men had to be circumcised at eight days to be under the covenant with God, all right? Here's the point. In, in a Nazarite vow, there are three do nots. Number one, you do not drink wine or strong drink. This is in your Bible. Number two, you do not touch a dead carcass of any kind. Number three, you cannot cut your hair, meaning you had to grow your hair long and not be able to cut it. Now, here's notice what begins to happen. Number one, rule no, <laughs> Samson breaks rule number one. He goes into a vineyard, and of course, he's not supposed to be in the vineyard, and there he's you know hanging out in the vineyard, and the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him in Judges 4, 14, 6. Well, Samson's like, well, wait a minute. I hung out in this vineyard, not supposed to be here, but God touched me anyway. So he thinks he's okay. Are you going to stay with me on this one? He thinks he's okay. Now, then he breaks rule number two. He touches the carcass of a lion. Read it in your Bible. And he gets honey out of the carcass of something which is dead. And in Judges 14 and 9, he would not tell his mother and father where the honey came from because he knew that his mama knew he was a Nazarite and shouldn't be touching a dead carcass. However, he picks up the jawbone of a donkey, and what happens? And the Spirit of God comes on him. Well, by now, Samson's saying to himself, wait a minute here. I went to a vineyard, and God told me not to, but I could still have the anointing. I'm about to preach. I went and touched a dead carcass, but I can still have the anointing. So stay with me. Samson now thinks he can play with the anointing. So what does he go after then? He goes after strange women. Now, he's supposed to be, he's a Hebrew. He should be marrying a Hebrew woman. He doesn't. He comes down in the territory where we are, and he finds a Philistine. And he don't just find one. This guy's a playboy. I mean, he's, play, he, I mean, he's playing his cards over here. You see, oh, I like her. Oh, I think I'm, mm -hmm. oh, can I talk to her, you know? So he's like the macho man, you know. He's like the uh, Arnold. He's the Arnold of his day. You, you'll get that in a minute, maybe. Uh, maybe I'm dating myself here. But he's strong. He's handsome. And so the Philistine went, oh, wow, look at this guy. This is the guy that can tie fox his tails together and burn the Philistine corn down. This is the guy that can take, take the gates of the city and run off with him. I mean, this is the hunk of Israel, man. This is the dude. This is the playboy. So what he does, he finds a woman he likes by the name of Delilah. What's he do with Delilah? She is paid by the Philistines to find out where his strength is. So now, I want you to notice how crazy the guy is. He said, oh, it's, it's in my hair, but here's what you got to do. If you'll put seven green branches on me, I'll lose my power. She does it. He doesn't lose his power. Then he says, take new ropes and tie my hair up. She does it. He doesn't lose his power. Now, wait a minute. By now, if I'm Samson, I'm saying to myself, this woman's up to something because every time she messes with my hair, the Philistines show up, okay? But he thinks it's a game. He thinks, hey, man, God's with me no matter what I do. So watch what happens. Then he says, put, put my hair in seven locks with a pen. She does that, and the Spirit of God comes on him. Hang on here. But then he says, okay, I'm tired of messing. You don't love me. You tell me the secret. You don't love me. Cut my hair, and it's over. You know what she does? She cuts his hair. Now, listen to this verse. This is really powerful. She said, after she cut his hair, the Philistines be upon thee, Sam Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep, and he said, I will go out at other times before. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, I went to the vineyard. I had the spirit. 
I touch the dead carcass, I have the spirit. So as I did other times, I'll go out, watch this, and I will shake myself, but he did not know that the spirit of God had departed from him. Now, I want to ask you a question. What happened? How come God didn't take the anointing when he touched the vineyard? How come God didn't take the anointing when he touched the dead carcass? Why did God take the anointing after Samson cut the... Because watch, because a Nazarite vow has three parts. When he broke part number one, God was still merciful because he kept two parts. When he broke number two, God was still merciful because he kept one part. But after he broke the three parts that God told him he could not do, God said, enough is enough, and God took the anointing from the man. He ended up blind and bound and going round and round. All because of this, God is a covenant-keeping God. And because God is a covenant-keeping God, we have to understand something about the grace and the mercy of God. Because God is a covenant-keeping God, he will always extend grace and mercy to those who are seeking his grace and mercy. Let me give you an example. I really believe what I'm going to say based on on the Word of God and based on my experience. If someone watching me has a weakness of their flesh or of their spirit, and they're trying to get victory over it, as long as they are humbling before God, sincerely saying to God, please help me. God, I don't want, and they go out and do it, but they can say, God, you understand, I really want help here. If from their heart they want help, you will discover that God will extend mercy to them, not justify what they're doing, not place his approval on what they're doing, but he extends mercy to give them more time for their freedom. You will also discover, however, that when somebody willfully decides, I don't care what God says, I'll do my thing, bam, look out, because trouble coming. Now, let me give you another example. There's a couple more, but here's another, another law of three in the Bible. And this is when God said Israel one day would have a king. This is what the Lord said. The king shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart, here's the commandment, lest his heart turn away, and he shall, be, he shall neither greatly multiply silver or gold for himself. So, here's the law. You're going to be a king. You can't do certain things. Well, here comes Solomon, another good-looking dude, man. I'm, this is David's son. Whoop, Solomon's coming. He breaks rule number one. He has, this is in 1 Kings 4.25. He has 40,000 stalls for horses and chariots made, and God told the king not to multiply horses. Now the, the, he breaks the second one. 700 wives and 300 concubines. 1 Kings 11.3. Is he out of his mind? Most men can't have one wife and make it, much less 700. Are you kidding me? That's a joke. Okay, chill out. That's a joke. But I'm saying there, he's breaking law number two. Then law number three, the gold was as plenteous as stones, 2 Chronicles 1.15, in the day of King Solomon. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 10.14, in one year, check this number out, he got 666 talents of gold. Where is that number coming at? It's the number of man. It's the number of the Antichrist. It's the number of flesh. It came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was his father David. 1 Kings 11, 8, and likewise he did, this is amazing, and likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and offered sacrifices to their God. Solomon was so influenced by those wives that the Bible even tells you that he offered his children, the children of these wives, to Moloch, to Moloch worship. A terrible, terrible, terrible idol. Now look at this. He had extreme wisdom, he had prosperity, and he had blessing, but Solomon was deceived into thinking that if I have the blessing on me, then no matter what I'm doing, God's with me. And yet he's breaking three of God's commandments, and he gets to the end of his life and said, all is vanity. The horses don't mean nothing, the women don't mean nothing, and the gold don't mean nothing. What means something? Did you keep the commandments of God? And he tells you that's what's going on. He said, when you get to the end, you're leaving it all behind. Solomon said, I'm going to have a son and don't even know what he's going to turn out to be like. Well, he had a son that split the kingdom named Rehoboam, if you'll check the Bible. And so his point was this. You're going to get to the end of your life, and you're going to realize that all your money, you're going to leave it behind. Your house, you're going to leave behind. What was important is getting to the end and keeping the Word of God, the commandment of God, and knowing where you're headed when your life ends. That's, this is the wisest man in the world who had it all, had all the women, the gold, the wealth, the horses, the palace, everything he wanted. Queen of Sheba said he was the greatest person she ever met. And he gets to the end of his life and said, it's all vanity. What matters is love God, stand before God, know you did the right thing. Because I believe at the end of his life, if you read the Bible, Solomon made his heart right with God. Now, this is how it fits in with you. And I want to just talk to you for just a moment about this. There are people that feel like if they can operate a spiritual gift, 
there are people that feel like if they can continue to minister, there are ministers really that feel like if they can still feel the anointing, that everything is okay, even though they may be doing things that they have not repented of before God. Maybe they're living a double life. Maybe they've done things and they've, and they, and they've never come clean with God. They've never asked for God's help. Please be careful. I'm talking to all of our saints here. You have to be careful in your walk with God to understand something, and that is this, that God is, 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 is always going to extend grace and mercy where you need grace and mercy, where you've humbled yourself before Him. But don't be deceived by the blessing. There are ungodly people who have wealth. There are ungodly people that have a lot of homes and cars. That doesn't mean anything because the world can operate on business principles and become wealthy. Here's the four things I want to give you. This is what the Lord told me to tell you in closing. Number one, stay humble before God. A great man of God that preached years ago that God prospered him. He's built a university, had a great ministry, but God told him, I have his old magazine from the 1950s. Don't touch the gold, don't touch the glory. And before he died, he gave everything away because he said, God is the one that gave it to me. Always stay humble before God. Number two, never retaliate against your enemies. God was merciful to David because when Saul was chasing him, David would not attack Saul or kill him when he had two opportunities. He would not retaliate against his enemies. Number three, this is important. Everybody listen, show mercy when people have fallen because the Bible says with the same judgment you judge, it'll come back to you. If you will sow mercy and the day comes that you fall or have a problem, God will bring people to your life that'll be merciful to restore you. But if you become judgmental, and preachers have done this. Remember in the 1980s, without me going into detail, preachers judged other preachers, preachers and a few years later, the same sin came on them. You cannot judge people harshly without God allowing that same thing to come to you. And I'll give you number four, which is very important. Keep a repentant spirit. Watch this. Samson gets to that temple, ladies and gentlemen, and he cries out to God and said, remember me one more time. You know what he's doing? He's saying, God, I sinned. God, I was wrong. And he grabbed a hold of that column. Look out, it's about to fall. And he started pushing. That thing moved. I'm serious. <laughs> He started pushing, and it fell, and he took out the enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, you can be restored even if you fall in the way Samson is. Cry out to God and say, God, remember me. I believe God will remember you, and he can bring you back to where he was. Well, there was more to the message. I sort of ran out of time, but we're here on Manifest, right here in this beautiful city on the coast of Israel, and I'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. Let's give the Lord a hand for the being here in this beautiful place. Amen. Praise God. Perry Stone has placed in print his new landmark book, Chronicles of the Sacred Mountain, written to help answer numerous unusual and complex questions about the heavenly mysteries of the past, present, and future. Some of the topics will include, with people in heaven from every nation, what language will we speak? If I had a miscarriage, is there proof in the Bible that my baby has an eternal spirit and I will see them one day in heaven? When we return to earth to rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years, what jobs will we have? Are there three or seven levels of heaven? And why are sapphires God's favorite gemstone? Do my loved ones in heaven have knowledge of what's occurring on earth? At death, does the human spirit of the departed linger for three days on earth as the ancient Jews believed? How will we look in heaven and will our family know us as they did on earth? If a loved one dies unsaved, will we always remember them, or does God remove that memory in heaven? What types of food will we eat in heaven? The Bible says we will one day judge the angels. How is that possible? These questions are carefully and biblically answered in Perry's new book, Chronicles of the Sacred Mountain. Perry also unlocks the Ezekiel 28 mystery, revealing how Satan was the anointed cherub and was assigned in the original construction of the New Jerusalem and how his gemstone covering led to his pride and downfall. This mystery is one of the most eye-opening revelations you will ever read. Along with the Chronicles of the Sacred Mountain book, Perry will also include a recent prophetic message on audio CD, The Daniel Key to the Messiah's Return, revealing a new timing of apocalyptic events. The book and audio CD are now available for your donation of just $30 or more. As a thank you, Perry is also including an additional audio CD, Hidden Prophecies in the Parables, explaining how end time predictions are concealed in the parables of Christ. You can order this new resource package online at perrystone.org or call toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. 
That's 1-888-212-7323. Or write Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. When writing or calling, ask for offer CS117. Obtain this resource package today and help keep Manifest on the air. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Just a brief statement here. In the history of book writing, I've been writing since I was 18 years of age. We've never had a response like Chronicles of the Sacred Mountain. People in the meetings are standing five, six, and eight deep to get this book because the content is absolutely incredible. I hope you take the opportunity to get your copy today. I'm coming to October the 25th. It's a Sunday morning. At 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 6 o'clock in Cleveland, Tennessee, Mount Olive Ministries, Pastor Gary Sears. We have an entire camp meeting day with him that day. You're invited to attend. One of our last conferences will be Friday through Sunday, October 30th through November 1st, Abundant Life Church of God in Lakeland, Florida, 7 o'clock on Friday, 10 and 6 on Saturday, 10, 15, and 6 p.m. on Sunday. And I want you to join me there. That's Lakeland, Florida. Then Wednesday, November 4th, Abundant Life Christian Center, Lamarck, Texas, and I'll be ministering there at the great conference there. One, one thing I want to take a moment and share with you that has, has been on my heart is I am seeing a great stirring in the youth of this generation. The hope that I have, we've talked about blood moons from Joel 2 and Acts 2. We've talked about the signs underneath the earth, the blood, the fire, the pillars of smoke, this type of thing. And you've heard us teach on this as well as other teachers. But the one thing I'm thrilled about is where God said, when you see these things happening, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, including sons and daughters. I know at OCI on Tuesday nights we have a service and also we have meetings throughout the year and we're seeing a great coming together of young people who are on fire for God. And one of the burdens I have, and I want to share this with you very quickly, is my father was a pastor years ago and he pastored in rural churches, very small churches, 50, 80 people. In uh, Big Stone Gap, Virginia was an example. I, he pastored in uh, 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 West Virginia before I was born up until I was very, very young as a child. And a lot of our rural churches have five, six, seven, eight, ten young people in them, but they don't have maybe a lot of activities for young people. And one of the reasons that we are doing what we're doing, like Warrior Fest, Reformation Weekends, is to give your kids in these churches an opportunity, get an adult, get a van, work with them to get them here in Cleveland, Tennessee during any of these conferences. There's no fee to attend any of them, but I'm telling you the life-changing power of God that comes together when young people join their faith together is absolutely incredible. I have to tell you this, you know, we're working on a study Bible, we're working on an International Leadership Academy Bible School, we're working on a mentoring school, we're working on a camp. I have so much going on. It's going to take a miracle from God to get it all accomplished and, and, and the financial part as well. But the one thing I can tell you, I've never been more excited in my life than I am right now to be living today and see what God is about to do. Remember, the enemy is not going to take over everything as long as God's people are still on this planet. I'll be seeing next week. Uh, seeing you next week here on Manifest. God bless you. Perry Stone invites you to be a part of the OCI family, November 6th through 8th at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee for OCI's first annual Fall Reformation Weekend. Jump into fall with powerful words from Perry Stone, Chad Daniel, and Mark Casto. Join us in worship led by Eddie James, Bryn Waddell, and the OCI band First Hearts. For more information and to register free online, go to OCIMinistries.org. Come be a part of the family at the 2015 Fall Reformation Weekend. We'll keep the fire burning.